Okay, I think that we will go ahead and begin our program. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Joseph Kearney, as I imagine is not a surprise or news to too many of you. And it is my privilege as Dean of Marquette University Law School to welcome you to this annual most special event. This afternoon we will induct into our pro bono society more than 100 individuals, Marquette Law students, or as we often say, future Marquette lawyers. The pro bono society itself was established during the tenure of my friend and predecessor, the late Howard B. Eisenberg, and we have done such an admission or induction ceremony for the past several years. That said, the numbers have increased in recent years in particular, and I want to say right here at the outset to those of you who are students and thus who have made this afternoon possible through the contributions that we celebrate today, just how much you inspire us, just as your predecessors did. Of more recent creation than the Pro Bono Society, but also inspiring to us, is the Posner Pro Bono Exchange. We begin this program, in fact, with this exchange in a few moments, which honors the memory of the late Gene Posner, a member of our class of 1936, who was a lawyer, entrepreneur, and philanthropist here in Milwaukee. It is right that we should honor his memory because much of our pro bono work has been supported by a gift of the Gene and Ruth Posner Foundation, which is led by Gene's grandson, Josh Gimble, a lawyer with Michael Best and Friedrich here in Milwaukee. In particular, Josh and his grandfather's foundation have made possible for the past several years our position of pro bono coordinator, ably filled by Angela Schultz, who has done so much of the work leading up to today, both in preparing for this particular event and far more broadly in working with our students on so many of their pro bono placements. I had the privilege to meet Gene Posner several times after becoming Dean before his death at the age of 90 in 2005. I was able to get a sense of the man, his commitment to Milwaukee, and his belief in the role of lawyers, perhaps Marquette lawyers in particular, in helping individuals to solve their problems, whether those individuals were replete with resources or were instead in need of more help. At the same time, my knowledge of Gene Posner is paltry relative to that of his grandson, Josh Gimble. And so I've asked Josh to be with us today, as he is each year, and to say a few words in remembrance of his grandfather and by way of introduction. Josh? Thank you, Joe. Um, it's great to see such a great uh, full audience here today. I see some familiar faces from those I've worked with at uh, the Justice Center with and familiar faces from the local bar, uh, most of whom are Marquette grads. Unlike my grandfather, who was a 1936 grad of Marquette, and a father who was a 1959 grad of Marquette, and a brother uh, who was a 1983 grad of Marquette Law School. I went to the other law school, but um, as, I was telling our, as I was telling our guest speaker today beforehand, I feel more loyal to this university than perhaps any of them. Uh, so, so I'm honored to be here. Uh, to represent my grandfather and the Gene Posner Foundation, uh, Gina Ruth Posner Foundation. Uh, this is the fourth annual exchange um, that uh, Mike Goucher has uh, ably uh, shepherded through, and we've had some great speakers. Uh, I know that my grandfather would be extremely proud to be here today uh, uh, because of what you have accomplished here, especially Angela and all the work that she's done and, and how she has uh, moved this uh, pro bono uh, uh, service to a new level here at Marquette Law School. Uh, I know that we're at a 20% increase from last year, I believe, uh, in, in honorees today. I agree. I think that's fabulous. Uh, my grandfather, who, who practiced law for well over 60 years, uh, ingrained in me uh, the notion that lawyers have a monopoly on providing legal services and that because we have that monopoly, we have a duty to give back and provide free legal services to those who can't afford it. So uh, if he were here today, he would be uh, extremely thrilled that the seeds of future pro bono activity by you future lawyers is right here in this room. And by doing it uh, as a law student, you have that ingrained in your culture to do that when you 
become practicing lawyers. So uh, I know that he would be honored to be here, and he would say congratulations and uh, carry on. Thank you, Josh, very much for those remarks and for what you do in service of Marquette Law School. And I agree that you have it all over your dad and your brother, although they're pretty good, too. Uh, Mike Couchet, who is our distinguished fellow in law and public policy, will once again lead the Posner Pro Bono Exchange. The exchange will be with David Stern. Mr. Stern graduated from Georgetown Law in 1985, clerked for two federal judges, practiced civil rights litigation, and then joined Equal Justice Works 21 years ago to create a postgraduate public interest legal fellowship program. The program is now the largest in the United States, with 180 lawyers working in communities around the country. Mr. Stern has been there throughout, serving as Equal Justice's executive director for the past 18 years. In March, just to give you a sense of the matter and the man, the National Law Journal named him as one of the 100 most influential lawyers in the country. Please join me in welcoming to Marquette Law School, David Stern. I did it. Thank you very much, Dean Kearney, and uh, thanks to all of you, and congratulations in advance. Uh, this is a, always a great day here at Marquette University Law School. I'm delighted to be with uh, David today, and we're going to talk about his organization, the great work it does, and, and public interest law in general, and student interest in public mm -hmm. interest law. So I thought I'd begin by, by asking you about the mission of Equal Justice Works. Let's begin there, and then we'll have a nice conversation. Terrific. So our organization is all about the next generation of lawyers who are committed to justice. And in contrast with a lot of perceptions that often happen in law school, where people are either the folks who do it full time or the people who are sellouts who go and make money in private sector, our organization actually doesn't believe in that dichotomy. Everybody has something to do in order to address the injustices in this country. So we try to work early in a lawyer's career, right when they start law school, to try to instill those values. And many of you are representative of that next generation of lawyers who come to law school. There's actually been a bump up of the number of lawyers who, law students who come to law school who want to do public interest work, Teach for America, AmeriCorps, community service that happens in high school and colleges, that really instill those values early. And what we try to do is nurture those along the way. We work with 200 law schools across the country uh, in order to try to collaborate. In fact, Angela Schultz is, uh, is on our National Advisory Committee. So we work with law schools to create better programs to support students doing pro bono and public service work. And then we have, uh, and we also work on educational debt, which I know all of you are familiar with. Um, <laughs> and we have a lot of resources to try to help people manage that debt while pursuing public interest careers. And then, as you mentioned, we have the nation's largest postgraduate fellowship program. We have 180 lawyers working around the country on addressing serious injustices. We have two programs, actually three different programs on that score. One is privately funded fellowships, very entrepreneurial. We'll show you a little video about that in a second. Another one is an AmeriCorps program. And the focus of that right now is shifting more toward helping veterans homeless veterans in particular, but veterans have a whole range of legal problems that lawyers are able to help with, untangling a big web of mm -hmm. obstacles. And then the final uh, piece is a public defender corps, where we sent 40 lawyers down to work in the South to try to really instill better practices in, in the South in public defender programs that are just so horribly um, performing and creating lots of injustice in the South. And again, you read about these stories of wrongful conviction and um, all sorts of things where if you traced it back, it's almost always the defense lawyer in the, in the beginning not doing an adequate job. And David mentioned the uh, privately funded fellowships. And, uh, and I know you brought a video with you that yeah. you wanted to show. So why don't you go tell us what you're going to show us. Yeah, so this is uh, the program that I helped to create um, 21 years ago, okay. which is a program funded by private law firms and companies. And again, it just the video speaks for itself. Okay. When I was in high school, my parents started and I moved with my mother and we ended up homeless. And the one thing that was stable in my life was school. Teachers, my friends didn't know I was homeless at the time and I just felt normal. Once we got stable and I got into college, I decided, you know, I want to address homelessness. 
so I went to law school. And during my law school time, I had a summer internship that worked a lot with unaccompanied homeless youth. And I learned about the Equal Justice Works Fellowship. I decided, you know, that's it. I'm going to create my job. I found the Chicago Coalition for the Homeless to be my sponsor organization and provide me with a site and mentorship. The Chicago Bar Foundation provided the money and Equal Justice Works I made all those connections happen. I knew the first thing I needed was to go to homeless youth where they are. We decided to do a mobile legal aid clinic that would travel to specific sites and hold office hours at times that homeless youth would be out in the community. A lot of my job was educating homeless youth that you may be on the street and you may not have a place to live, but you have a right to go to school and I can make that happen. My project gave my clients stability they needed to complete school and become successful adults who move beyond homelessness. I'm proud to say that Youth Futures, the project that I created through the Equal Justice Works Fellowship, is actually living on today. Each year, hundreds of law students design projects that they're uniquely qualified to perform. They team up with nonprofit host organizations that have agreed to hire them at the Warden Fellowship. What we are is a good matchmaker in being able to connect those people with innovative solutions to sponsors that are capable of funding them. How much freedom do students have in designing the work that they do? Well, it's, it's actually fascinating and inspiring every year because you see the creative ideas that people come up with uh, for ways to address injustices. So I'll give you one example that has just propagated across the country. So a few law students came up with this idea of lawyers being embedded in medical clinics. Okay. So a doctor sees a kid who has asthma, and they can treat the asthma, but when the housing conditions are actually causing the asthma because of mold and other conditions in the house, the doctor's not dealing with the underlying cause. But by having a lawyer who's literally right there in the clinic and being able to point that client over there and say, this person can help you on your housing issue, you can get a much better health outcome for that family. And so um, as we did this, we started with one or two of these fellowships funded by Pfizer, a few other companies, and then it just started spreading across the country, all these new fellows. And the thing that was so great about it was they brought new funding. Because if you know anything about legal services funding, it's always a challenge within foundations. It's just a tiny sliver of the money that foundations give. But access to health care, that's a different arena altogether. And so for a lot of these legal aid programs, it created a new source of funding to sustain those programs. And again, a lot more got replicated. And this is the generation of innovation and people coming up with, you know, there was a panel that was on a conference a few years ago saying, the title of the panel was, who the hell do they think they are? And it was two sides of the same equation. The young people coming in and saying, who are these old guys running this organization? We have great ideas. We run Google. We created Facebook. Give us some opportunity to lead and create. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, of course, are the experienced folks like me <laughs> who say, you know, you young whippersnappers, there's some experience and expertise that, that I've got to offer. So that combination, though, unleashing that talent, it has been a remarkable winning formula. We have 80% of our former fellows, we've had more than 1,200 fellows, 80% of them are still in the public interest field today. So these are launching pads for these projects to get underway and to keep going. Let's talk about some of the, the challenges you take on. Uh, some of your fellows are dealing with immigration issues. They're dealing with foreclosure as an issue. They're dealing with uh, civil rights. And I know recently, and this is something I know you feel strongly about, you, you've begun to focus on uh, veterans' legal issues. How do you decide what you're going to focus on and the resources that will be brought to bear on that? Well, this is the beauty of Equal Justice Works is that there's no single issue that we focus on. We're agile as an organization, and we're willing to adjust based on different circumstances. So when Katrina hit years ago, we said, mm -hmm. well, we have access to very talented lawyers who want to go and do service. Why don't we connect those folks with the legal problems, with the legal needs? So we sent 19 lawyers down to Katrina. Then we did something around foreclosure. When the foreclosure crisis hit, we got funding from AmeriCorps to be able to fund 30 lawyers to help people facing foreclosure. They helped 1,000 people stay in their homes, return on taxpayer dollars, 70 to 1. So that's the kind of numbers that in the White House had us come in on the anniversary of the Recovery Act saying, this is how your tax dollars 
are making a difference and leveraging real results in communities. And then on the veterans, this is now a really hot issue. There are so many returning soldiers um, from Iraq and Afghanistan who come back and they face a whole set of obstacles. Many times they've suffered illnesses like post-traumatic stress injuries or traumatic brain injury. These are not like losing a limb. They're hard to diagnose. They're often conflicting opinions. And it really requires lawyers to be able to distinguish between and make the arguments. This is why this expert is believable, and that one isn't. This one actually met the patient and knows what the conditions are and heard the symptoms. And this other one is doing it based on the record. Do you know what I mean? Sure. Yeah. So, um, so that kind of, uh, th that's one example of the disability claims. The other big issues are, and again, you just don't know these things until you, to, until you meet these veterans. But they have issues like a suspension of driver's license. Well, if you don't live in a place where there's substantial public transportation, that's whether you have a job or where can you get affordable housing. So addressing that issue about getting that driver's license reinstated is a key issue. Then there's substance abuse issues. There are warrants that get issued that forbid them from then getting benefits or having, um, getting access to public housing. If you don't address those issues, you can't stabilize those families. So the needs are enormous. We, have, we will have 40 lawyers out there doing this work. We currently have 17. We're bumping that up to 40. It's a drop in the bucket compared to the needs. And in fact, we've been talking directly to the VA to see whether we can increase the number of lawyers who are working on these issues, because they're really substantial. The good thing for you, though, is, is as you said earlier, David, that there is this great interest in public interest law. Are you surprised by that? What, what explains it? Well, I'm not. I, I would say that the trend is favorable in terms okay. of more and more students doing it because they've had these experiences before law school. And then these experiences that all of you have had today that are getting this recognition. You've done it. You've experienced it. And when you see, when you look in the eyes of a client and you see the difference that your legal skills can make in changing their lives, that is contagious. It just makes you feel like you've got to do it again. And, you know, I have the privilege of working with some of the top lawyers in this country. And when I talk to them about their life and their experiences, almost always it's those public service experiences that are the most rewarding, the most satisfying, the things that they recount as being the highlights of their career. Every year there's this Lifetime Achievement Award that the American lawyer gives out. And you just look over the cast of characters. And again, nonpartisan, it's all across the board in terms of the people who get this award. And yet every time one of them gets up and speaks, it's about some public service experience, whether it was service in government, with pro bono experience, but something that was giving back. And that was the most satisfying part of their career, even though they had very illustrious professional careers, building firms, mm -hmm. making a lot sure. of money. But those were the things that they highlighted in their remarks. And, and there's a growing recognition. I mean, in, in some respects, we're on the cutting edge here because you were telling me about New York State to, to get into the bar in New York State. This kind of work is required now. That's true. So um, this was something I'm sure many of you have heard about this, but the chief judge in the state of New York came up with a 50-hour mandatory pro bono requirement in order to be eligible to be licensed in New York. Now, the definition is very general. It's you guys have done the real, genuine pro bono work. No compensation, no credit, out there just volunteering. For the New York rule, they allow everything to count, clinics, summer internships, paid, unpaid, just service to low-income communities. And again, I'm not against that. I actually think if every law school had a public service requirement where sometime during law school you had an opportunity to experience how you can use your law degree in order to help somebody else, that would be a great thing. So I'll give you one quick story that's one of my favorites. There was, and again, I, we're, we're agnostic on the question of mandatory pro bono at law schools, but there is this law school in New Orleans, Tulane, they have a mandatory pro bono program. And there was a student who resisted and disliked the idea that they were being forced to volunteer. <laughs> Don't like it. It's like an oxymoron. Why should I be forced to do it? And she went and did it, and she wrote a letter. It's a two-page letter to help a client who was being, facing eviction. And she preserved housing for that person. She said, a few hours of my time made such a fundamental difference in that person's life. And she was hooked, and now she's the pro bono coordinator for a big firm in New York. So it's just, you know... Those experiences are really powerful, even for those who are reluctant to do it in the first place. And then they often get bitten by the bug and they want to do it for their career. So you're trying to create the next generation of public interest lawyers. One of the things you do, and Equal Justice Works does, is you have this really big career fair 
once a year. Can you tell our students a little bit about that? I think it's going to be in October of this coming year. It's true, Oct yeah. October 23rd, yeah. uh, actually 24th and 25th, um, and it is about 1,300 students come from around the country. They interview with public interest employers, and that includes government agencies, public defenders, prosecutors, some private public interest law firms. So the wide variety of public interest employers. But there are two things about this. We've been doing this for a bunch of years. The gathering, the community that gets created in this group where people are learning, there's some panels that are going on that are how do you, how do you interview for a public interest job? How do you create a loan repayment assistance program on your campus? How do you add a pro bono piece to your curriculum? Things like that. So, so there's some skills-based training, some things about advancing the cause. But the thing that I will say is, when I meet people who've gone to this conference, they say, you know, I felt like I was part of a bigger community than I did on my law school. On my law school, I felt like I was part of a small cadre of students who wanted to do this. You should t count your blessings. At this school, based on the number of people who are receiving awards today for their pro bono service, that is very substantial. That is unlike a lot of other law schools where people feel that they're a little pocket of public interest, public service, pro bono-minded students. But when they come together, they feel validated, they feel affirmed. They also are exposed to a whole variety of career choices that they don't see in law school, like lobbying for the public interest. There are lots of jobs in Washington, D.C. involving the environment or around consumer rights or things like that, where they come and they say, geez, I didn't know that this was a possibility. I think your speaker last year, Maria Foscarinas, mm -hmm. she, she did work to get the McKinney-Vento Act passed. Mm -hmm. Well, that is huge leverage and has made a huge difference on behalf of hundreds of thousands of homeless people. And that kind of high leverage impact is powerful, and you don't often see that in law school as a career choice. Sure. I don't want to rain on the parade here, but let's, let's talk about the issue you raised earlier because it is an important part of the discussion, student debt. Uh, because there are probably students in this room who would love to pursue public interest law, but they're thinking to themselves, I'm going to owe X amount of money when I leave here. I don't know that I can afford to take that kind of job. What is your organization doing to address the, the student debt issue? Yeah, so this is, a, this is an area of expertise we've had since the organization was founded in 1986. So first, we started working on loan repayment assistance programs. And I know Marquette has one of those programs to help people who graduate who take low-paying public interest jobs, help them with their debt payments. But then a few years ago, Congress passed and President Bush signed a law called the College Cost Reduction and Access Act. And this law changes the landscape for people who want to do public interest work. It does something very sensible. It has one part of the program is called income-based repayment. The more you earn, the more you pay. The less you earn, the less you pay. So for graduates of law school who take a public interest job, and I'll give you two numbers just to show you how dramatic this is. So if you earn $45,000 a year and you have $100,000 of debt, which is not uncommon, and by the way, it's always pegged to the salary, that debt doesn't matter. It could be $120,000, $150,000. It's always going to be tied to the salary. So at $45,000 a year, you would be making, well, let me first start with $100,000 of debt. Normally, you would be, make $1,000 a month in payments. Under this program, at $45,000 a year, you pay $300 a month. Now, the president has recently revised this program to improve it and bring those payments even lower to perhaps $200 a month for that same person. It's called pay as you earn. Many of you may have heard the president talking about this. But that, too, will make it a lot more affordable for people to take those jobs and keep up with their debt payments. Now, the second part of the law that's the real lottery for us public interest-minded people is something called public service loan forgiveness. So if you stay in qualifying employment, and that's public interest, government, organizations, for 10 years, it's 120 months, it doesn't have to be consecutive, but if you accumulate 120 months of service, your debts are forgiven. Your federally backed debts are forgiven. And that is a huge windfall, and it really does make it possible for those fellows, like that woman you saw earlier, to say, because we provide assistance during their fellowship, but before the backpack of debt used to be put right back on their back, right at the end of the fellowship, and they couldn't pursue a public interest career. This law enables them to actually have a trajectory for 10 years. And while I know many of you are young, and 10 years may be almost half your life, <laughs> 10 years once you get out of law school it goes by in a minute. And so many of our graduates of our program have stayed in that program, and they're now earning. They've been in the public interest for 10 years, but now that that law is in place, they're earning forgiveness. 
So they'll win the lottery. The $100,000 of debt will be relieved after 10 years. There's a lot of information on the equaljusticeworks.org website uh, if you're interested in that. So. Indeed. In fact, the, the one thing we have on there, again, for anybody who's interested, there's a lot of webinars and resources and simple information. There's also an e-book that allows you to really do a deep dive and have an understanding. I would say to every law student, it is really, I, I get upset about this, is the financial illiteracy among people who have taken out really substantial loans equivalent to a mortgage. And you don't really understand what the implications are when you're taking out the loans. And then it's only when you're in law school thinking about what do I do afterwards that you start to realize, wow, this could be handcuffs that are preventing me from my choices. Good avenues available to relieve that, but you've got to know about what your loans are. You've got to know about your repayment plan. I wanted to ask you about uh, the difficulty that comes with public interest law work. It can be tremendously rewarding. But I was reading about you, and after you had clerked for a couple of federal judges, you went to work for a public interest uh, firm, and you said it was the most grueling and the hardest work you had ever done. So make the case why that's a great career choice for, <laughs> for, for the people in this room. <laughs> well, I do. I, re I remember those days, 20-hour days were really the norm. It was just the hardest work I've ever done. It was three lawyers, um, and we took on enormous cases. So I'll give you just one case just to give you an illustration. So there's a woman who had AIDS. She got admitted to the hospital. They knew she had AIDS, and this was at a time when everyone was very worried about AIDS. So she was suicidal, so normally you would send her to the psychiatric ward, but they didn't do that. They sent her to the surgical ward because they said, well, we can isolate her if we put her there. Mm -hmm. So they put her in there, but they didn't take any of the precautions that they would normally take for somebody who was suicidal. So she took an overdose of medicine, they pumped her stomach, and then they tied her to the bed on four-point restraints, tying her arms up to one corners of the bed and her legs to the other corners of the bed, and they left her there for three days. And there were all these signs on the door telling people not to go in because of the fear of blood and body fluids, et cetera. So no one went in there. Everyone was scared of this woman. As soon as we saw this, this was illegal. You can't do that in Washington, D.C. They have to be prescribed very in short increments. So we went and got a temporary restraining order, and we got those restraints removed. And then we had a very large case involving discrimination by the hospital against somebody who had AIDS and saying that they did not use the standard of medical care that was in use at the time. So after a year of litigation, Williams and Connolly, a very big firm, was on the other side. 300 pleadings between the sides, and just the most intense litigation you can imagine. And we had lots of other cases in addition to this one, <laughs> so there were a lot of cases going on. But ultimately, it had a very good outcome for that client. Um, now, my frustration with it was I'm working my tail off for a year, We've made a big difference for that one client. But the next day, another case came in that was very similar. And I felt like, you know, I could be doing this for my whole life and be making a difference for one client at a time. And while I know that's important, this idea of mobilizing an army of lawyers to go and do this work felt very compelling to me. It felt like that could really make a difference because I saw how many people we were turning away. And I got excited at the prospect of, Look at all this talent. Look at all these young people who are coming out with a desire to do something. Let's put them to work on these issues, and we will make a difference. I can sense there's still the excitement for you yeah. uh, in, that, in that possibility of changing, uh, for the lack of sounding a little silly here, but changing the world bit by bit. That's yeah. still what drives you. It is. And every year, we had this year 425 applications for 57 fellowships. So. The ones that got away, I mean, that is my motivation. Every year when I have to sign those rejection letters, I'm like, how in the world can't we be funding this extraordinary person who has all the qualifications necessary to make a difference in the world, and we're turning them away? And every year we have these fellowship sponsors who meet these young people, and they say, how in the world can't we be funding some of the very top of our profession who want to go and make a difference in the world? They could get a job at any firm that they wanted to, and many of them, that's not what they want to do. They want to go and make a difference in, in their community. So I'm very motivated every year when I see those folks who get away. And they do make a tremendous difference. So yesterday, you mentioned immigration. Yesterday, three fellows, two of them current fellows, one of them a former fellows, successfully got a federal court decision in Southern California that said, if you're seriously disabled, and you're facing deportation in immigration, you have to have a lawyer. You're entitled to a lawyer. And that is, yeah, that's groundbreaking work. And so when I get to 
live vicariously by funding these really talented young lawyers to go off and do this work, it is very satisfying to see those, those changes. A couple more questions, and then we'll take a, a couple yeah. questions from uh, audience members. Um, and, and since uh, David is one of, uh, as Dean Kearney pointed out, one of the 100 most <laughs> influential lawyers in America, I, I thought it would be a chance to talk to him about a couple of trends. Uh, you have said that uh, this is a time of change for law firms and law schools, uh, institutions that are not always anxious to change. Um, in what ways are they being forced to change? And are those changes good, ultimately? Well, I think they are. But it's, you know, that old line of never waste a crisis. Um, right now, there's a crisis because you can see law school admissions numbers, the applications numbers have been dropping 50 percent almost in the last seven years. Um, and then you look at um, the job numbers when people are graduating from law school, 55 percent are employed, 45 percent unemployed. Those are scary numbers, and law schools have to adjust. Now, I can tell you from the other side of the equation, from the professional side, the companies that are hiring these big law firms, they say, we want practice-ready lawyers. We don't want to spend a lot of our money hiring somebody who's untrained to actually deliver services. So law schools have to look at the market, they, just like every other industry, right? You've got to look at what's being demanded, and you've got to adjust. So law schools are beginning to look at more programs to integrate practical skills into the curriculum, create more clinical opportunities, more summer public interest internships, more externships, where people have a chance to get hands-on experience under supervision, but hands-on experience where they learn how to practice law. To me, that is like, I thought that when I was in law school, a lot of years ago. You know, the more you can actually get into the field and do this work, the better able you are to sell your skills. And nothing like pro bono and public interest work to give you those skills. And I will tell you that from my experience, the people who engage in that work, they are the most sought after. You know, we, you look at the people who have been in the U.S. Attorney's Office who come out of there and go to a firm. That's who the, that's who the clients want. <laughs> they say, I want somebody who's been in court, who's actually done this work not somebody who's been behind the scenes pushing paper on discovery matters or doing things that are unrelated to the real practice of law, really doing it. So, so I'm a big believer in give them those experiences in law school and afterwards, these like fellowship programs, that really gives people a chance to do it. Is this sea change temporary or, or have things changed for good for law students, law schools, law firms? Well, we've had this debate in our organization for several years. I don't know if any of you remember this deferred associate campaign that happened a few years ago, where law firms hired more than they had capacity to occupy in terms of their time, and they said, well, we're going to pay these lawyers to not be at our firm for six months, pay them $75,000 for a year, so maybe six months right. of that, and then they would go off and they'd do public interest work or work at a, um, or actually not work at all. But after that program, a lot of the law firms said, said, you know what, these experiences that these young lawyers had were incredibly valuable when they came back to our firm. They gained competencies of interviewing clients, investigating cases, learning about, you know, standing on their feet in court. And those things were actually covered. So several people said, well, why not let's create something that would be a permanent program like that. Our board ultimately said, this is a blip in the screen. Temporary hiring of a lot of excess capacity, they are right-sizing now. Don't adjust your programs in order to create a permanent program like that. So we didn't. We did not change the ship. We just said, let's keep on doing what we're doing. Let's not try to create new programs for law firm-bound lawyers. And there was also a good debate. Our board consists of federal judges, corporate counsel, managing partners of firms, law school deans, law students. And there was just no consensus that this was a direction we wanted to go toward because they're like, don't spend time and energy on those who are law firm bound. Yes, it's a good thing for them to be doing this, but we have so many people who want to do this for their careers. Let's spend most of our time on those folks. Sure. And again, it's a, it's a balance. So what's, so what's your best piece of advice uh, to the students in this room? Well, I would say take the experience that you've had and keep this as part of your life throughout your career. You know, the people who, as I said in the beginning, the people who have done public interest work, pro bono work, they find it the most satisfying. For those of you who are trying to find your path, I know there were a few of you who applied for fellowships this year, and I wish that we had more fellowships to offer. But what I will tell you is I have seen, and in the last couple of years, like there's nothing like a crisis to create ingenuity, you know, innovation. 
So I have seen people come up with really creative strategies to launch new law firms that are focused on representing the middle class, which often do not have a lot of representation, figure out how to create fee-generating cases to supplement low bono or pro bono work that they do. And then there are people, and again, this is so interesting. I was just at Wake Forest last week, and they had folks who said, I was sure I was going to be a public defender. I've done that work now for two years in law school. I know that's not my calling. But a community economic development program, that is my calling. And I can see opportunities, new micro-businesses that are getting created where I can get in on the ground floor and help those programs get started. So all I can tell you is right now is a time to be creative. There are a lot of opportunities out there, even though I know it's scary. And for folks who are generally risk averse, I mean, that is our nature. That's kind of what we're taught in law school. It's hard to make those leaps, but the people who do, they tend to make this you know, extraordinary leverage and they, and they make a go of it. You know, 80% of our former fellows are still in the field right. and it's because they got that first rung on the, on the ladder. So again, I just want to encourage you all to keep this as part of your lives and if it's at all possible, if you don't have a, a job prospect right now, get in there anyway and try to start finding a place where you can volunteer or do work in order to build those skills because once you're shown as valuable, those organizations will find a way to keep you on. We have just a few minutes for questions. Does anybody here have a question for, for David? Uh, anything on your mind about uh, what he does, what Equal Justice Works does, or what you might want to do uh, in the future? Any questions are welcome. Sure. Yeah, that's in. Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, the question is about the conference and career fair. It is held in Washington, D.C., and uh, again, it's a Friday-Saturday program in, in late October, and you can find all sorts of information about it at our career fair, including which, on, on our website, which has information about what employers participate. Mm -hmm. I know. Josh? It says that you had to reject a lot of scholarship uh, proposals you came through. Were there some real creative ones that you want to share with us? Oh, my gosh. Um, there are a bunch. So there is actually one topic that is really hot right now, which is around human trafficking, sex trafficking, where people who are, and there's actually one very compelling story. This woman actually did get a fellowship, but it's, it's very representative of some other folks. So this woman was living in a uh, household that had a lot of domestic violence, and uh, her mother divorced her husband, remarried another man who was uh, an alcoholic and was abusive, and one day punched the woman, the mother, in the face, and the young girl, then 12 years old, left and never went back. And she said, I could have easily gone to sex trafficking as the only way I could have survived. But instead, happily, I landed in a family that basically took me in and took care of me. Now I've gone to law school. Now I want to go back and help people similarly vulnerable to what I was. So she's going to be doing work in New York on behalf of these sex workers who are often accused of crimes, and once you have that, in, that judgment against you, the conviction of having been a sex trafficker, you can't get a job, you can't get public housing, you can't break out of that industry. That's your only industry. And so by showing that they are victims and getting their records expunged, which is now a growing trend among states, is to try to expunge those records so these people can actually get out of the sex trafficking business. So that's an example, and we had three or four of those also very compelling that did not get funding this year that I thought were really compelling. A lot of projects around immigration, a lot of projects around affordable housing, and lots around veterans. Um, a lot of our work is funded by companies and law firms, and those tend to be, they're, they're interested in having people in their community. So the geographic restrictions is often a challenge because if you have big companies and law firms in New York and they want to have somebody who's right in their vicinity so they can engage in pro bono work with their fellow, then it means that Wisconsin's not going to have their fair share. So it's actually one of my strategies is to try to keep on expanding and growing the number of these fellowships. The hottest property right now for us are law firm and company co-sponsored fellowships where a company puts in half of the money and the law firm puts in the other half so you can imagine from a law firm perspective, they say, this is a great thing for us. We get to do something with a client. It's around a feel-good event. We get to participate in picking the fellow and then having them work with us on pro bono projects. And we share the cost, so it's lower cost. I mean, it's just a, it's a winning proposition. And right now, we've had big growth in that. Just to give you one quick number. So two years ago, which is our benchmark, because these are two-year fellowships, we were at 45 fellowships two years ago. We're at 57 this year. So we're in the face of a bad economy. 
So we're, we found something that we think is, has upside, and we're just beginning to really grow that program. I'm going to wrap this part sure. of the program up. Um, I just wanted to say before we go, we, we mentioned some of the, uh, the accolades that have uh, gone to David throughout his career, but uh, he was also uh, one of President Obama's champions of change who were recognized for that. And I think any of us sitting in this room today uh, can see the, the enthusiasm that, that fuels your work, and uh, it's really been a pleasure oh. having you with us here at Marquette well, Law thank School. You, Mike. David Stern, thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Mike and David. That was indeed inspiring. I myself think of education as substantially involving learning from examples. And without doubt, David, you are an exemplar of what one can do with a law degree and a lot of enthusiasm and a public spiritedness. And I'm really grateful to you that you would come to Eckstein Hall and to Marquette Law School and spend some time with us here in Milwaukee. So let us now turn our attention to our students. It is true that they have not yet earned the appellation of Marquette lawyers, although some of you are awfully close. But they have distinguished themselves in ways that really do reflect already a commitment to some of the best ideals of the profession. In particular, even while students, even while contending primarily with the demands of academic rigor, including four credit internships, and with the frequent need to find some remunerative work given the financial exigencies that law school imposes, even in these circumstances, these individuals have provided pro bono work. The students whom we honor this afternoon have met rigorous criteria in this regard, as David suggested. They have provided at least 50, and in some cases more than 120, hours of work that has been A, not for academic credit or compensation, B, supervised by a licensed attorney, C, primarily legal in nature, and D, in service of the indigent, those who otherwise lack access to justice, or a nonprofit with such a mission. 119 students have thus achieved this year, almost a third of them at the 120-hour level, and some 87 are with us this afternoon. While this includes some first- and second-year students, let me note this. When one combines the graduating third years being inducted today with members of this year's third-year graduating class inducted in past years, one half of this year's graduating class of Marquette lawyers will be members of the Pro Bono Society. That is awfully impressive in my estimation. <laughs> These hours include work at a remarkable range of places as befits a school, this law school, that claims and is claimed by an entire city and even a broader region. So, speaking directly to the students, let me note that you have worked at places such as the Marquette Volunteer Legal Clinic, with its now four locations, the Milwaukee Justice Center, Family Law Help Desk, the Marquette Legal Initiative for Nonprofit Corporations, the Bankruptcy Help Desk, I Know Your Rights Trips to the Kenosha Detention Center, in the Wills for Heroes program that the State Bar of Wisconsin undertakes, in the Domestic Violence Injunction Hearings Preparation Project, a new joint effort just this calendar year of Quarles and Brady and the Sojourner Family Peace Center. At the Refugee Help Desk of the Pan-African Pan Community Association. In the Voces de la Frontera Immigration Law Clinic. At the Metro Milwaukee Foreclosure Mediation Program. And on the Wills Caravan Spring Break Trip to Wisconsin's Indian Tribes, with which I conclude the recitation, even though I do not come remotely close to exhausting the list. So let us proceed with Angela Schultz's reading the names, whereupon we would ask each individual to come forward, and it will be my privilege to present him or her a certificate recognizing induction into the Pro Bono Society. Angela? Thank you. Um, thank you, David, for sharing your story. And let me also just take a moment to thank Dean Kearney and also to thank Josh Gimbel. 
Um, it's really your vision, your significant contributions, um, and your ongoing support that allow us to have an Office of Public Service here at Marquette Law School and really allow us to have the range of pro bono opportunities that we have. I look forward to continued work with those of you who are going on as law students and also hopefully to continuing work with those of you who are approaching graduation and will soon be sworn in. I hope you'll come back and join us in your new capacity as a volunteer attorney um, at our clinics, but I also just remain available to you as a support in your future pro bono endeavors, whether it's at one of our clinics um, or in some other capacity. Do keep me in mind as somebody who you can reach out to. Now, as I read your name, please do come forward to accept your certificate, acknowledging your accomplishment, and congratulations. The front row, you can just stand. <clears throat> Phoebe Amberg. Lindsay Anderson. Andrea Arndt. Erica Avery. Stephen Ayala, Blaine Balo, Priya Barnes, Miriam Banani, Christopher Ballam, Chelsea Brocker. Kenneth Brooks, Nicole Camelli, Kelly Cavey, Chantal Couture, Colleen Crowley, Alyssa Curtis. Mark Darnader. Tristan Dollinger. Elena Faley. James Ferguson II. Makta Fesahai. Trisha Fritz, Zachariah Fudge, Heidi Gabriel, Lisa Galvin, Matthew Galvin, Elizabeth Gabarski, Gregory Helding, Grant Henderson, Amber Hinson, Cody Horlocker, Crystal John. Michael Jude, Brian Crows, Dana Lefebvre, Catherine Legal, Gabriela Leija, Katie Lonzi. Maria Lopez, Patricia Mattingly, Kaylee Mayer, Amy McGinty, Eric McGregor, Christina Miner. 
Christopher Molnar. Jill Miller. Margaret Murphy. Kelly Noggle. Megan Osling. Janan Paul. She was not here. Kira Plyer. Amber Raganese. Dylan Ronio. Kosser Rosby. Thomas Rhodes. Joe Joseph Riepenhoff. <laughs> Kenneth Ryder. Nita Shakir. Allison Shepard. Gillian Simpson. Joy Sisler. Naomi Stanisuski. Brandon Steele. Pamela Stokey Cece. Catherine Tomitz. Ryan Truesdale. Emily Vandera. Annabelle Vang. Aaron Vansalo. Ryan Vega. Theodore Wendell. Cole White. Jared Widseth. Willie Williams. Melody Wiseman. Zachary Witchow. Mindy Nolan. And Matthew Topin. Congratulations, everybody, on your significant work. Thank you, Angela. Thank you to all of the students. Ordinarily, when I give out a certificate or a diploma, my ordinary words are congratulations. But in this instance, I go with thank you because of the things that you have done for others and the things that you have done for Marquette University Law School. I could not help but note in the video that the particular student depicted, depicted as in a stick figure, uh, <laughs> so I guess I mean that literally, uh, was working with the Chicago Coalition for the Homeless. And unless I miss my guess, that is an organization that is run by Rini Habach, who is a Marquette lawyer from the class of 1978, and in fact was our first Posner pro bono exchanger with Mike Couchet back in 2010, one of the final events in the old building. Uh, Rini had not been here for some time and came back and it was sort of an emotional event because she said it was exercising some ghosts of Sense and Brenner Hall. I hope that when one of you returns some years hence to be the Posner Pro Bono Exchange Fellow with Mike Goucher, that you will not feel that you are exercising ghosts so much as returning home. In any event, 
my understanding of Angela's term and condition and handing out the certificate was that none of you really are allowed to go away for very long. So um, I think that is a wonderful idea, Angela. So there really is little more to say except, again, thank you. Thank you to David Stern for being here today and for the example that you set and for what you do. Thank you to Josh Gimble and to the Posner Foundation. Thank you to Mike Goucher and to Angela Schultz and to Associate Dean Matt Parlow for all of the things that you do for the pro bono and public service program. And again, thank you especially to you, our students, on behalf of the Marquette Law School community, including both those of us who work in Eckstein Hall and the ranks of Marquette lawyers more broadly, we really admire the pro bono work that you have done, even while students. We look forward to your work as Marquette lawyers, and I hope that everyone will join us outside this room in the Zilber Forum for a reception. Thank you.